addition to what we've been hearing about plovers and the other water birds, nesting water birds, etc., we also have some other significant constraints to moving toward that stairway to heaven, um, toward uh, more marsh habitat. And that's what the next session is going to focus on. So first we're going to have Peggy Olafson talking. Um, she's with the uh, San Francisco Estuary Invasive Spartina Project. Um, I'm opening now, I'm with the Invasive Spartina project, I'm opening now with a slide, is this on? Put it up higher. You have to put it up higher? Okay, is it, does that work? It doesn't, it's just not sounding, oh there, now it's sounding like it's working. Okay, now it's sounding like it's working. Okay, the slide that we're looking at now, let me see if I can manage my space here a little bit. Uh, okay. This is the, the Cooley landing that Ron Duke showed us a little while ago. In fact, this is very much the same slide that, that he showed about Cooley landing. And what we're seeing here, uh, we're, what I'm going to be talking about is invasive spartina and habitat restoration. Um, and what we're seeing here, as Ron pointed out, is we have a, a large tidal marsh restored area and the mouse doesn't seem to be working. Do I have a pointer? No. Yeah. No. Oh, here's the pointer. Okay, there's the mouse. Okay, so here's the tidal marsh area. Here is an airboat that's out in the channel in Cooley Landing that is deploying people. Can we see the, the arrow here? No? There it is. There it is. Okay, so <laughs> there's an airboat that's deploying people to do Spartina control in this very large marsh area. You can see we have the uh, some blue areas. Here is an area that was determined to be hybrid Spartina and it's been sprayed. That's a blue dye that's in the, the spray so that we know what it is. Here's some spots over here that are blue dye. Now if you look back along here, you see there is a walkway. This is the causeway that goes across Cooley Landing. If you look real close, you'll see there's a bunch of people back along this causeway and there's people out in this marsh here too. That's part of the treatment crew that's out there. This is a huge undertaking to go out and monitor this marsh, Cooley Landing, uh, try to identify those plants that are uh, hybrid Spartina from those plants that are native Spartina, Foliosa, and to try to treat and eradicate those ones that are non-native. This is the, the situation that we don't want any tidal marsh restoration project to have to be faced with ever again. This is a, a very difficult situation. It's costing a lot of money, it's taking a lot of time, and it's very frustrating. And this is one of my favorite, absolutely favorite, probably my very favorite tidal marsh restoration in the Bay for all the reasons that Ron was talking about. It's absolutely an amazing project. It's a very beautiful place. And we don't need the hybrid out there uh, causing problems. So th the Invasive Spartina project uh, is funded uh, to start with by a number of different state and federal agencies. Right now we have significant funding from the American Resource Recovery Act. We're very grateful to them. Uh, state Coastal Conservancy, of course, is the sponsor. Um, we've received funding from a number of federal and state sources over the years. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but as most of us know, there is a native Spartina foliosa and it is a very important component of our tidal marsh ecosystem. As we probably know, there are four non-native species that were introduced to the bay, Densiflora, Peytons, Anglica, and Alterniflora. And this lovely guy over here on the right-hand side is the one that then hybridized with the native and created a hybrid swarm, back crossing multiple times with both parents, and invaded the marsh ecosystem very aggressively, taking over well, pretty much any place it could find, actively taking over any place it could find. Um, we, were, we started mapping the extent of uh, the hybrid and alternative flora and all non-native Spartina in 2000, uh, right after the project was started by the State Coastal Conservancy. The Conservancy started in 2000 with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, because someone, people brought to their attention that this plant was invading all of the tidal marshes and something needed to be done about it. So they jumped in, they started the project. Um, we started mapping immediately. In 2003, we started producing our first GPS or GIS based maps. And uh, in 2006, this was the extent of 
uh, that, that we were able to see of Invasive Spartina. This was uh, 800 net acres, actually 2006 is probably more correct on this, um, within about 20,000 acres of invaded wetlands. And this is net acres if you were to pile all of the Invasive Spartina that there were around the bay, pile it all up into one pile, this is how much Spartina that you would have. It's not what was spread out over throughout the marsh. So in about, let's see, 2005, I uh, was hearing from researchers at UC Davis that uh, they suspected that, well, as you know, uh, tidal marsh restor restoration started back a long time ago in the 19, what, about the 1930s with natural tidal marsh restoration when levees were accidentally broken and never repaired. So we had places restoring. And then it, it started accelerating through uh, the next couple of decades. In 2005, the researchers at UC Davis were uh, suggesting that restoration projects could actually be accelerating the spread of the invasive Spartina. Because the newly opened sites created a perfect nursery environment for the, the hybrid plants, which could grow at lower elevations in the tidal marsh spectrum than the native plant could. So it would be the first one to go in there. And then it would be protected from waves and other things. Uh, well, we were, I was curious about this. It sounded like it, w it was viable. And so it's in order to start looking at that, I took uh, our tidal marsh, our invaded acreage map, and I overlaid it with a GIS map. At this time, there were, okay, I over overlaid it with a GIS map made from the wetland tracker from San Francisco Estuary Institute at that time. And at that time, I was able to see from this overlay that 56 of 96 projects were invaded by 2005. That was accounting for 4,300 project acres. Uh, 30,000 more acres of restoration were planned. And of these sites that were invaded, many of them had become dominated by invasive Spartina or were, were well on their way to becoming dominated by invasive Spartina. And this was what the Spartina project was tasked with, was trying to find where these plants were, coordinate with the people uh, as was necessary, and try to get the Spartina out, the hybrid Spartina out of these locations so that a more natural ecosystem could develop to be able to support the goals that the people who were restoring the marshes wanted to have supported. So. So to put it, this makes it a little more real, this map, if we look at actually what those, res those invaded restoration projects were, uh, many of us had been working on getting these projects built for a lot of years, and it wasn't our vision that they should become invaded by a, a non-native plant and dominated by a non-native. So we see uh, from the, uh, we have La Riviere Marsh and Mayhew's Landing and Stevens Creek and Charleston Slough, a uh, number of mitigation projects. Uh, seal slough, any, pretty much any restoration project in the South Bay particularly, which was where most of the, the invaded sites were, pretty much any restoration project with the exception of, I believe, three when I counted in 2006 had been invaded. S recent additions to this, uh, I just went back and looked at this data in, ta in anticipation of coming and talking here. In 2007, uh, we, were, we found Spartina hybrid in the Nordstrom shorebird marsh in Marin. 2008, we found it for the first time in Richmond Parkway marsh, at the KGO Tower marsh and Triangle marsh in Marin. There are many Triangle marshes. This is the one in Marin. Uh, 2009, uh, a number of, well, the Eden Landing Bomberg marshes have gone through a number of iterations of opening new areas. Everyone that's opened has been invaded by Spartina and we've been controlling there. Uh, also, Plummer Creek Mitigation Marsh, which had avoided being uh, invaded for quite a long time in 2009. We discovered the first plants there, and in 2010, we did the first treatment there. Uh, also, Color Spot Marsh in Outer Bear Island. I note that all but two of these projects are mitigation marshes that were done solely to mitigate for impacts that were done somewhere else. And I can tell you that the people who did the mitigation projects aren't paying for the monitoring or for the treatment. Um, the other two projects are restoration projects that were done by state or federal agencies, and they were actually, uh, they're much larger areas, much larger invaded areas, but part of restoration and not as mitigation. My watch list now is, we don't know why the island ponds, which is just off the picture here. There's a lot of hybrid Spartina down around here. Um, I'll be talking about that in a minute. We don't know why island ponds hasn't been invaded yet. It's a miracle. So we're keeping our eye on it.
um, it seems to be doing okay so far. Also, as you know, SF2 was just opened, and that is right here. There's a lot of Spartina all around there. It's muted, so it shouldn't have a problem, but there's an intake channel that uh, we are keeping our eyes on. And also the nap track, I still call it a nap track. It was uh, a, a, a pond eight? Six. <laughs> it's because I can't keep track of numbers. Uh, so on Calaveras Point, right across the way from there, sometimes this thing works and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, on Calaveras uh, Point in the marsh along here, we recently discovered quite a lot of new hybrid uh, and so we're very concerned about this project. We're going to keep our eye on that too. Uh, what did we do about the Spartina? Quickly, we treated it. We went out primarily with herbicide in most areas for hybrid Spartina, uh, applied by a number of different ways. We coordinated with 10 different grantees, the flood control districts, mosquito abatement districts, cities, a number of other uh, uh, agencies, nonprofits, uh, Friends of Corte Madera Creek Watershed, for example, California Wildlife Foundation. We got money out to these people, we developed plans, we got permits, and we went out and we did the control work, pretty much whatever way it took. Here you can see uh, a densiflora, digging densiflora. We had to dig densiflora. This is a very large plant. You have to pull it completely out of the marsh and take it off the site or it will regrow. Um, we have uh, airboat application, helicopter application, ground application of herbicide. So were we successful? Here's a few shots that show actually three different sites that I've chosen to show. Here's Burlingame Lagoon in 2006. This is a patch of Spartina hybrid. Uh, this is in 2010. You see there's still stubble that's out in the marsh area here. Um, it's beginning to, the, the stubble is evolving, the root mass is degrading and it's starting to return to more of a mud flat area. Uh, we don't know whether this kind of an area returns to what it was before. It depends a lot on the environment. It depends a lot on the hydrology of the area as to what's going to happen there next. Um, here is uh, 2006 airport channel. Um, similarly, here it is in 2010. Um, beginning to uh, also where you can see, I'm not pointing it out here, but on the, uh, these areas over here have colonized with pickleweed and the pickleweed is growing very well. Here's one of my other favorite sites besides Cooley Landing is uh, LC Romer Bird Sanctuary because I've been taking my kids there since they were little, um, watching it become a hybrid meadow. And here it was in 2006. We had already tried treating this site for one year and it was a dismal failure. And we tried it again in another year, and it was another dismal failure. This site was really, really hard. It was very old and established with big root mass and very difficult. But in recent years, um, this is in 2010, I was out there. We uh, had constructed some channels to try to develop some topographic variation where some other kinds of plants could grow when the, the Spartina was removed. Um, here we have the channel showing on the left-hand side and a pan. It's actually creating a tidal marsh pan <laughs> out there in, in what used to be Spartina a hybrid meadow. And uh, here's another kind of view of that same sort of place. Disregard the mustard in the front. You'll see. <laughs> and there's ice plant in the front. We're hopefully going to work with Save the Bay to work on some of these things. But um, I'm, I'm pleased, very pleased with the progression that's happening there. So this is, this is our report card. Since um, the project started in 2000, we got our first effective year of control in 2006, which actually this is off one, one year. The, uh, the, the first year of treatment was 2005. The first really successful year of treatment was in 2006. Um, since that time, we've been very successful. Uh, we've been able to coordinate better and better with the partners. We've learned more about the plant. We've learned about when to treat it and how, um, how to follow up. And we're now down to less than 100 acres. Um, however, this is still spread throughout, well, now 50,000 acres. It's, all, it's now in, in various patches up through the North Bay and up into Sassoon. And, uh, but the acreage itself, if you glump it all together, is quite a lot less than what it was. Um, so now the challenge that we have is that this is with any weed problem. You saw before I showed you pictures of big Spartina meadows that we had in 2006. Here you see this little patch of plant here amongst this pickleweed. This used to be hybrid back here. Finding this and killing this was easy and it was a joy. Um, <laughs> 
Now going back and being able to find and map and treat these little patches that are spread all over the bay is very difficult. And this is the most important part of any weed eradication is getting these last guys out because they will grow and begin to produce more seed and begin to export seed. And before you know it, you have the same problem you had before. So this is what we're doing. I'm borrowing these sli slides from Ingrid Hogel, our monitoring manager, who was responsible for developing um, a lot of these techniques and our, our monitoring data, uh, our management for our data to be able to do this. Now we have this person here is, I think this person is in the room. Um, we have uh, technicians or monitors who go along with treatment crews out into the marsh and they have a GPS unit with them that says this is where all the, the Spartina is that we know of and so they lead the person to that patch and they say spray this patch. Um, extremely labor intensive but according to what we've been able to find out from talking to other people doing other weed control programs and especially in the state of Washington, Kim Patton who's done research and published on it there. This, you need someone who's not trying to spray the plant to actually find the plant and identify it and point the person there in order to be able to get those last patches. So this is the way we're doing it now. And <laughs> this is, I just love this picture so much I had to do it. So yeah, we're <laughs> this is another person who I, I, is, is in the, the room. Um, we have great staff and they work with the crews. The crews are, are uh, primarily contractors, also ag department and a number of other people who go out and do this work and uh, our crew, not only does our crew while they're out there uh, show them where the Spartina is, we also show them where the clapper rail habitat is so that they can go around the clapper rail habitat. We also point out, well, this is a place where salt marsh harvest mouse is so you need to be very careful about where you uh, track your vehicle. Don't go over too many places. Um, so we take care of that kind of thing. So now what's for the future? I'm doing good on time, aren't I? Yeah. Um, so what's for the future? She said, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, we were just asked to, to uh, look at a, a picture of how far along towards eradication we are. And we had to think, first of all, what is eradication? And I'm, uh, we, the seed life for, okay, the seed, the seed bank is about one year for folio, so one and a half years probably, I mean for alterniflora. It's longer for, for densiflora. Um, based on that and based on where we, we are at in treatment right now, we believe that within three years from now, uh, we can be, have 90% of our sites, uh, that's 153 of our 170 sites, at the first year of zero, that we will find no Spartina at 90, or no non-native Spartina at 90% of our sites by that time. We believe we can monitor then for three years and declare eradication by 2016. Maybe not all of those sites, but we have a good chance at it. At 10% of those sites, they're not there yet. It's going to be a number of years longer um, before we can get to our first zero year of Spartina at these sites. Um, seven of those sites are most clearly not going to make it. And I'm going to stop. Here, here we are. Arrowhead Marsh, like I'm going to stop. Uh, <laughs> Arrowhead MLK Marsh in uh, San Leandro has been phasing treatment using sublethal application of herbicide because of concerns on clapper rail. They're still many, many years away from controlling the Spartina, let alone eradicating it. Um, Bear Island, B2 North, has problems because of uh, a few years of bad treatment, things that went wrong. So we're a few years out on that one. Cooley Landing is just complicated by the, the hybrid versus foliosa issue at the site. And it's going to be a number of years longer before we get that one completely eradicated. Calaveras Point, um, we just in 2008 were able to determine that stuff that we thought was foliosa there actually is hybrid. So uh, Creekside Park Marsh is, is Densiflora. And then Southampton Marsh, it's Peyton's, which is uh, in with endangered soft bird's beak, so it's complicated. Here's our timeline, um, what I just went over since 2000, started treatment in 2006. Uh, we believe most of the sites can be eradicated by 2019. But what about the hybrid? I never mentioned the hybrid, did I? So glad you asked. Um, I have, we are planning a forum to discuss the Spartina hybrid issue for March 10th and 11th, 2011. There's a flyer about it out in the, uh, the area here. I have a number of them with me. Uh, come and discuss that with us in March. And um, 
and it ought to be a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, um, continuing on with our um, challenges theme here, um, Cheryl's going to give us an overview of the California gull situation. We've touched on it earlier with uh, Plover, and um, uh, uh, Cheryl will also talk about some things they're planning to try to control this issue. I have the dubious pleasure of being asked to speak about California goals today. Um, among our key uncertainties for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project is the impact that California goals may be having on our population of other nesting birds in the South Bay. Goals are opportunistic feeders and they very readily include the eggs and young of other species as well as their own species in their diet. Um, and so as we go forward with tidal marsh restoration and concentrate nesting birds into a smaller footprint of ponds, we're going to have to have a strategy for how to limit the ne negative effects that these gulls could be having on other water birds. So you'll note that I don't have any co-authors and nobody else wanted to be on this with me really, but um, <laughs> actually I've just taken data and photos and, and downright slides from a number of other people. Um, they just don't know about it yet. So this is an overview of the talk. This is, um, I'm going to talk about California gulls in the San Francisco Bay Area and then beyond. Their effects on other species, which actually Mark and Caitlin have both covered very nicely. Um, cumulative effects of gulls plus the restoration project. And how we can improve nesting success of these other nesting water birds. And again, those are um, on the bottom. Those are the people I've actually taken data from. I would like to point out that not all gulls are created equal. Um, those of you who are birders already know this, but the San Francisco Bay Estuary is a very important area for wintering gulls. We have a huge array of species um, that use this area for mostly for wintering grounds, just like we have shorebirds and waterfowl here in their highest numbers in, um, in the winter, as well as during migration in fall and spring. This is the culprit that we're talking about, and they do look really cute when they're small. Um, for the most part, this uh, California gulls are an, an inland breeding species. As you can see on the map there in that rust color, um, really they are from California over to Manitoba. They're located in parking lots and lakes throughout, which is the species description. <laughs> um, you can see also that this is an old map, because if you zoom into San Francisco Bay Area, we're blue, and so we're supposed to be a wintering ground only for this species. However, if you are here in the spring and summer, 99% of the gulls that you see out there are going to be California gulls. So in 1982, California gulls established a colony on Pond A6, also called the Knack Track. Um, and people were very excited at the time, I think, because this is the first coastal breeding ever recorded for this species. Uh, we are less excited now because we have about 46,000 uh, gulls nesting uh, in the San Francisco Bay and the South Bay overall. 23,000 of those nest on a single colony in Pond A6. We have really good data um, taken by other people <laughs> um, about where gulls spend their time while they're in the Bay Area. So this is monthly bird abundance of California gulls in the spring, and this is data taken from USGS and SFBBO monthly surveys. And so the areas in, in orange and then rust are, um, those indicate higher numbers of birds, and those really clearly indicate uh, where the colonies are. And then with obviously the darkest color right here, that's pond A6, and I'm sure those, everybody knows where that is by now at the end of the day. California gulls have also established themselves um, in other areas besides the South Bay in the past few years. We ha now have colonies from the Farallons all the way inland to the Central Valley, basically. These could very well be birds that were, um, were in the South Bay originally and then have spread out to these, these other sort of nearby areas to establish new colonies. Outside the, the Bay Area, um, Mono Lake has traditionally had the largest California gull colony, um, and 
Nesting populations in, in Mono Lake and the San Francisco Bay show a strong ne negative correlation for the, for the past two years, which indicates some sort of exchange between the two. Birds that decide not to nest in Mono Lake, for example, may be nesting in San Francisco Bay instead. And then you can see in two of the past three years, colonies in the San Francisco Bay Area have actually been larger than colonies in Mono Lake. So um, Mark and Caitlin already talked about some of this, but these are um, our other nesting species in the South Bay. Um, California gulls, we have evidence of California gulls basically um, being predators on all of these species. Um, in addition to predating on these birds, they also encroach in um, colonies that used to be forester's turn colonies or have now been turned into California gull colonies, and we see that happening in a number of ponds, islands and ponds throughout the South Bay. And then we also have had our first nest of California gulls up at Eden Landing, which is our stronghold for snowy plovers. So that doesn't bode very well for the future as we have um, gulls looking for new nesting sites. Another benefit to being one of the last speakers of the day is people have already explained the slides that they've used, um, and I have the same slide. So Mark showed this, and where these circles indicate um, colonies of nesting birds and Pink is avocet, blue is still, orange is forester's turn. The bigger the circle, the bigger the colony, basically. So watch what happens when you overlay this, this map here with these large numbers of other nesting water birds, and you overlay that with, um, with gull use areas. So the area in red is basically where the gulls spend most of their time, and that overlaps really nicely with where these forester's turns, avocets, and stilts are nesting. So there's a lot of opportunity there for gulls to forage on um, these other nesting birds. So we know California gulls eat and push out other nesting birds. Um, a further constraint for nesting water birds is the restoration of ponds to tidal marsh. So relocating nesting, this will relocate birds to, uh, nesting birds to other areas and concentrate them into a smaller footprint. So for example, um, this is a picture of pond A6 and what it looks like um, for the past 10, 15 years probably. Um, this, you'll remember, is, houses the largest gull colony of 23,000 birds. Um, however, it was also breached last December. So this area is obviously no longer available for nesting as it's largely underwater now. Um, and the question remains, where will 23,000 California gulls, gulls go to nest this year? We expect them to nest on the perimeter of this levee that still remains. We expect them to join other colonies, and we also expect them to probably start new colonies. Um, in reality, we don't mind California gulls um, nesting here, as long as they're not causing these major impacts to other non-gull nesting water birds. So really, it's more about um, how to improve success of non-gull water birds. And so we've identified three tactics for this. One of them is creating and maintaining an island within ponds. A second one is shells, which I probably should have, after the question for Caitlin's talk, I should have really um, changed to be more like toppings, something besides just shells, but maybe oyster or um, sand, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then the third one is a creation of no gull zones, which I'll also talk about. So this is an example of the first one. This is pond SF2, which you've also seen a couple of pictures of today. Uh, 30 nesting islands have been created here um, for use by terns and shorebirds, we hope. Um, we will see who nests on, nests on these in the next couple of months. Um, again, as the Salt Pond Project restores more ponds to tidal action, these managed ponds are going to become increasingly important to create and manage. And this includes things like weed management and predator management. Um, and these, and even though Eric Maroos hates it when I say this, we are talking long-term management for these ponds. A second, a second strategy um, is using these oyster shells that Caitlin explained. Um, uh, the jury is still out as to whether or not these really function um, to protect snowy plover, nesting snowy plovers from avian predators. If you take one year of data, you understand what happens. If you take two years of data, you don't understand what happens. So I think as Greg Schellenberger said in the first talk of the morning, really should only take one year of data, I think. Um, regardless of if, these, um, if the shells do work, 
we're going to have to figure out a better way to get them onto the pond bottom. This is an extremely labor intensive uh, process that Caitlin didn't go into the gory details about for you. But I, I will tell you that you see all those people with buckets. They put all these shells out there by hand. And it looks like in ponds that are um, flooded for the winter, these shells only last a year. So if you're talking about annually placing shells out here, um, the California Conservation Court, they're not going to continue to do this for us, I think, even if we pay them. <laughs> it's just horrible work. So uh, we're going to have to find a much more efficient way to get shells out there if this does look like it works. And then the third um, tactic that we've identified is, is some sort of uh, creation of no gull zones, where we actually try to actively keep gulls from roosting in large numbers or nesting in certain areas. Obviously, we are not the only people out there who um, are trying to keep gulls or, or various other birds, but mostly gulls, uh, off certain areas. However, we are um, in the business of providing for um, wildlife habitat. So while there are quite a few different methods for getting rid of gulls in, in specific areas, none of these are, are very compatible with the mission of a national wildlife refuge or an ecological reserve. Um, I don't think I, we could get ourselves a permit to use border collies, <laughs> for example, on the refuge. Um, so our methods are really going to be more along the lines of monitoring closely where California gulls seem to be congregating and then walking through these areas to deter them from setting up shop. Um, so we're going to focus on some really specific no goal areas and that includes Eden Landing where our snowy plovers nest and it also includes Pond SF2 where we have those really nice new shiny nesting islands where we want terns and, and avocets to show up and not California gulls. And then finally hopefully we can just find a way to have a, a healthy population of California gulls in the South Bay and while still increasing the nesting success of our other water birds that are here. And that's it. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, our next speaker is Mark Marvin de Pasquale from U.S. Geological Survey. He's going to talk to us about mercury. Um, one of the problems that the project um, has is uh, mercury that we inherited from, you know, uh, legacy mining or historic mining that occurred um, in the upper part of the watershed, especially in El Viso. But as anybody who's worked in the Bay knows, you know, there's mercury in, in, um, throughout the San Francisco estuary. So, Mark? Well, thank you, and I'm glad to be here as part of the gloom and doom session at the end. But uh, actually, there's some, there's some very positive news, I think, in many of these stories. I, I want to just uh, send out an acknowledgement to my co-authors, uh, co-PIs on the project. Only Mark uh, Herzog is here today, who you've heard from, but also working with us uh, from USGS Biological Group is Josh Ackerman and Colin Eaglesmith, and, and Daryl Slotten is at the UC uh, Davis. There are many, many uh, people involved in this work, but we, we um, would be reluctant not to thank the funding sources and, the, uh, and Laura Velopi and John in particular at South Bay Restoration Program and uh, logistical support from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We just heard from Cheryl. Um, and all the people on the ground that collect all this uh, data, uh, Daryl Slotten only has one left hand. <laughs> this is a group of uh, folks in my lab that do a lot of the mercury work and uh, and a big thank you to all the field folks at BRD who collect all of the, uh, the fur, uh, bird and fish data. So uh, by way of background, this is a, a photograph of the construction of Pond A8. Um, the idea here is uh, we're going to be re restoring muted tidal flow to the A5, A7, A8 complex through uh, a notch structure which was um, built just this last year in Pond A8. Um, the idea is to convert uh, much of this uh, footprint into uh, wetland habitat, if we, as we've talked about. Uh, the notch was just completed and it's expected to open in just a few months from now, in the spring of uh, 2011. Um, with that, though, uh, we already know is going to come large changes in the hydrology and, even more importantly, the sediment dynamics in Albizo Slough. If you were here for the earlier session, I asked this question to the panel of round one. and. 
this is a little bit of a plug, not for my stuff necessarily, but it's very, very important, I think. Uh, the folks who study the movement of sediment and particles and where all this material is going to go is a really critical thing for the whole restoration um, program for, for many, many projects. Um, contaminants just being one, but habitat and, and all. So as we set our priorities in a limited, funded, um, in limited funding area, um, this is one area that might be being under, under dumped, particularly with respect to Elviso Slough. So we're concerned about mercury uh, in Elviso Slough. We know that it's the, sort of the tailpipe uh, draining the largest mercury mines in North America, um, the New Almaden mines. Um, it is one of the most contaminated uh, stretches uh, of, of water and sediment in probably the United States. I'm going to show a map about that uh, with respect to mercury. We're concerned because once the notch opens, a lot of sediment is going to be remobilized and a lot of historically buried sediment is going to be remobilized. And so ultimately we're concerned about the wildlife that we're trying to protect. Um, a big question is, and we don't know the answer to this yet, um, will we enhance uh, mercury uptake into the food web once um, this goes into play? So this is sort of a big experiment, and it's exciting in many respects, but we do know some stuff. Uh, a project a number of years back that I was involved in with SFEI, San Francisco Estuarine Institute, we looked at a, a, a number of, we took um, two meter long cores at about 15 locations, um, a third of which were in the main slough channel, and uh, two thirds of which were on either side of the slough channel. And the profiles I'm showing you right here are just the ones uh, within the main uh, channel of Alviso Slough. This is a depth profile, two meters long. This is mercury in concentration units of micrograms per cubic centimeter. And if you, if you basically add that up uh, on a square meter, looking down two meters, we're talking about for this, for this blue core right here, about one gram of mercury per meter squared for that location. As we go downstream, this is Here's where the A8 notch is. As we go downstream, we're about at 1.3, 1.8, 1.9, and then it drops back again to about 1. Uh, so we, we have, uh, with this data, these 15 cores that we took and, and looked at in very fine detail, uh, and we're fortunate enough to uh, have had done uh, a sediment mobilization study, a modeling study, by uh, 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 Philip Williams and Associates, and, and they were kind enough to let us use some of the information they had on how much sediment is going to move just when you open up Pond A8. Now since then, we've just opened up Pond A6, but from that we were able to calculate, uh, well first of all, how much mercury is in Alviso Slough, and we're looking at about uh, 1,600 kilograms, give or take, uh, and that's about a ton and a half of mercury in this stretch between uh, the A notch and the mouth, not counting anything upstream of that. Um, based on how big the notch is in Pond A8, how much mercury is going to be mobilized? Well, the, the notch can either be open to a 20-foot width or a 40-foot width. So at full capacity, we're talking about moving about 125 kilograms. Over what time scale? We're not sure. Where is all the sediment exactly going to go? We're not sure. Certainly some of it's going to go into these ponds that are a lower elevation. Some of it's going to go out to the bay. Some of it's going to go onto the marsh plains during high uh, tide events. It's going to go to a lot of places. And we don't know, and no one's really doing this right now, this uh, sediment mobilization stretch in Alviso. So, and we're not doing it as part of our current study, unfortunately. We don't have the, the know-how, but there are people who do. So uh, this is some fish data from earlier work that... Um, Josh Ackerman and Colin Eaglesmith did a, looking at uh, fish mercury concentrations in a whole suite of ponds. And one thing that jumps out is this red bar here is Pond A8, um, far and above highest in mercury contamination than on all the other places they looked. Here's the effects level where there are uh, known effects to, um, to fish, and so it's well above that. And so are a number of other ponds in the South, uh, South Bay. Um, this is fish data from Daryl Slotten at uh, UC Davis, done in conjunction with SFEI as part of the Regional Monitoring Program Small Fish Project. Uh, this is Silverside uh, data collected just in 2008 from all throughout the bay, from near the Delta, North Bay. And, and the only point here is South San Francisco Bay, again, has very high concentrations relative 
to these other uh, areas using these small fish as biomonitors, if you will. We call them uh, biosentinels. Uh, just a little more background data to sort of drive home the point. Again, data from Josh Ackerman and Colin Eaglesmith. Um, this is a graph of uh, the percent of the breeding population of these four species, uh, many of which were talked about today, that are at risk based on how much mercury is in their blood. And uh, green means low risk, yellow means moderate risk, and red means high risk. So the avocets, the stilts, the terns, uh, the Caspian tern, and the forester's tern, uh, over half of the forester's terns are at high risk, 48%. And if you consider moderate and high risk, or, uh, well more than half of the, uh, of the Caspian terns. Most of the data for this was collected around South San Francisco Bay. So we already know that there's a mercury problem in the biota in this region of the bay. Is it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? So uh, the goals of our project is to take advantage of the management action, that is the construction of the A8 notch, and this is one really good example where the science got out a little bit in front of the management action, uh, where we're looking at mercury concentrations in water, in biota, and in sediment in a coordinated fashion before A8 gets open and after A8 gets open. Only one year before and only one year after, but it's something, and it's, and it's coordinated with the, in the activity, so that's very good. Uh, my group is uh, in charge of looking at the water and sediment dynamics, and I'll show a little bit of that data today. Um, the, the USGS BRD folks and, and Daryl Slotin's group are looking at biosentinel fish in ponds and sloughs. And uh, as was talked about earlier today, we're also uh, concerned with uh, avian risk. And they're largely looking at um, using eggs as biomonitors for, this is Josh and uh, uh, Colin's work, looking at eggs as biomonitors for avian risk. So the whole project is really focused around what we're calling the biosentinel toolbox, and we're focused on, on uh, these four or five species. The three-spine stickleback, um, where we're looking, uh, it exists both in the ponds and the sloughs, so we can compare ponds and sloughs. Uh, the Mississippi Silverside, which uh, is, is the link to Daryl Slotin's data to the larger bay. We're going to continue monitoring that. Um, and uh, two species of birds, the forester's tern, as I mentioned, it's the bird most at risk. Uh, and um, the BRD is monitoring the eggs from the nest and sampling eggs for mercury, and the American avocet, which is a good indicator for localized uh, feeding. In terms of uh, my group's work, it's a whole laundry list of stuff here, but we're looking both at water and at, at sediment. And without sort of re just reading down the list, we're, we're very interested in particularly uh, mercury on particles and mercury dissolved. Uh, because the partitioning of mercury on particles or dissolved plays into how it gets into the base of the food web. And a really important concept in mercury bioaccumulation, uh, it's been shown, Robin Stewart here at the USGS has showed this really nicely, is uh, certainly mercury bioaccumulates, but what's really important is how much it accumulates that very first step going from the water into the base of the food web, the phytoplankton, if you will. Uh, and it varies quite a bit. Um, this first jump, and so we want to know something about that. So we also want to know something about the particles at play uh, in the water and a number of iron and sulfur uh, speciation things I won't go into today. Um, so our study, um, in this last year we sampled um, fish in water during April, during May, and, and between June and July, and then again in August, we, we sampled fish water and sediment, and then fish again in September. Um, here are the five sites that we're sampling uh, for an Elviso slough, upstream of the notch, right at the notch, mid slough, and near the mouth. And our control site is Mallard slough, right next to the pond A16 here. Uh, that's being sampled for fish water and sediment. Uh, in addition, in the yellow, the circles are where the sediment's being sampled, and the uh, so the straight lines or the squiggly lines are where uh, Josh Ackerman has fish traps largely associated with levees and, and islands. Uh, so there's three main sites in Pond A8 because that's where most of our effort is. Uh, it's it's uh, near the notch, just on the other side. Uh, this A82 here on the western edge and in the top northwestern uh, corner near the pump house if you've ever been out there. 
In addition, we have two control ponds, at least the way we originally designed the study, there are two control ponds, two types of controls. This pond A3N is not breached, and it's not going to be breached. So this is a pond where we're looking at before and after effects in A8, A3N not breached, and it's going to stay that way. Uh, A16 has been breached in the past, a number of years back, I can't remember how long. Uh, so this is a breach pond, and it's going to stay that way. So those are our two controls. Um, we've taken additional uh, samples in A7 and A5 uh, because uh, during the first sampling we weren't getting a lot of fish and we were concerned that we wouldn't overall. That, that uh, changed, so we collected more samples from A5, A7, and uh, the triangles are where they, the bird nests are. Okay, just a little bit of data. Um, so I'm going to show a couple slides like this. Uh, and Basically, I've organized the data into control ponds. Uh, the three sites in Pond A8, uh, the Alviso sluice sites going from upstream to downstream, and the Mallard sluice site over here. And just a few overall trends. Uh, two of the three sites in, LV in Pond A8 were quite high in mercury. Uh, and the trend in Alviso slough, not surprisingly, was highest upstream, and, and mercury decreased as you went downstream. This is total mercury. Okay. We saw similar kind of thing with methylmercury. Methylmercury is the form we're most concerned about. It's the form that accumulates in food webs. Those same two sites in Pond A8 that were high in total were also high in methyl. And this site, which is the one near the notch, was, was uh, low in both methyl and in total. But that trend we saw uh, for total mercury, we don't see in Albizo slough. And surprisingly, the next highest site in methylmercury was Mallard slough, our control. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of explanation as to why we see some of these trends right now. The data is just starting to come in, but I did want to share with you some of this. Uh, in terms of dissolved methylmercury, uh, uh, Pond A8, this is three water samples at the three locations all averaged. Uh, Pond A8 was the highest. We see an, uh, generally an increasing trend going from upstream to downstream in dissolved methylmercury uh, in Alviso slough. Uh, in terms of the percent of methylmercury associated with particles, the, the general trend here is that ponds have a higher percentage of methylmercury associated with particles than sloughs, 5 to 25 percent compared to 1.5 to 2.5 percent. Pond A8 in some ways is, is unique in some senses compared to at least our other control ponds and maybe compared to many of the ponds. Uh, it was talked about earlier, it's truly hypersaline. This is, uh, I'm using specific conductance here in terms of salinity. This is for seawater. Um, Pond A8 is about uh, three times that. It's very hypersaline. It's also very high in dissolved organic carbon um, for a lot of reasons I don't have time to go into, but m far and above all these other sites. Very high in DOC, which fuels microbial processes. So uh, two very quick data slides at the end. Um, this is an XY plot of salinity versus what we're calling a, a partitioning coefficient, or a KD. And it's, this is for total mercury. It's a description of the relative propensity for mercury to move from particles uh, into the dissolved phase or, or the other way. The, the only thing I want you to understand from this plot is uh, low numbers mean mercury is moving into the dissolved phase. High numbers mean Mercury is moving more towards the particles. And what we see is this general trend. These are the A8 sites. Uh, these are the sluice sites. Here's the control ponds. As we move across the salinity gradient, more mercury, total mercury, is moving into the dissolved phase. We see the same kind of trend with uh, methylmercury. And in a similar way, as we move across the dissolved organic carbon gradient, we see a similar thing. Uh, it tends not to be linear. It's a very interesting feature. It might have to do with different kinds of organic carbon, not just concentration, but different kinds of quality. Um, so I'm going to leave you with just a few uh, take-home messages. That little bit of data is a teaser, much more to come, certainly. Um, and Mark Herzog used the same slide. <laughs> and I, this is a great slide. And I stole it from him, so I can't really complain. But uh, the take-home points here are, are uh, that Clearly, uh, the, the fish, the water, the sediment, and pond are clearly contaminated with total and methylmercury, and it really stands out uh, in terms of uh, many of the other ponds. Uh, pond A is also extremely hypersaline and very high in dissolved organic carbon. 
which may have something to do with why uh, many of the fish are so much higher in some of the other ponds. It's a, right now, uh, we'll throw that out as a hypothesis. Uh, but this idea that the partitioning of mercury on and off particles is a function of salinity and DOC uh, can play a role in bioaccumulation. Uh, we've done our pre-breach work, 2010 work. Uh, we're still analyzing samples, particularly the biology samples. I didn't show any of those today. Uh, Post-breach work obviously starts this coming year right after Pond A is uh, opened. I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb, and I don't think it's too far of a stretch. In some ways, Pond A8 has nowhere to go but down in terms of mercury. We do think that um, once it starts tidally flushing, once it becomes more similar to some of the other ponds in terms of its salinity regime, its DOC regime, uh, at least in terms of the footprint of Pond A8, uh, the mercury problem will improve. This is not a prediction about what's going to happen in the larger um, Elviso slough chain of, of ponds, but for Pond A8, I think the prospects are looking pretty good. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, uh, invasive Spartina, California gulls, and mercury to worry about. And if that's not enough, we also have sea level rise and climate change. So John Takakawa is going to talk to us about that. And John Takakawa is with the U.S. Geological Survey. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> I guess I get to finish this session of doom and gloom, but hopefully we can kind of come up with at least a perspective on what we should be looking at relative to sea level rise. I'd like to recognize my co-authors here who have been uh, part of the research team looking at this issue and trying to determine how habitats right now are affected by tidal uh, uh, highs and lows and whether or not we can interpret from that what may be the future with sea level rise change. One of the things that's most important to remember about the restoration, it is directed toward tidal marsh recovery to a great extent, and there are a lot of species that are involved that are either endangered or listed, and it is a relatively expensive endeavor. So with this in mind, sea level rise and the effects of climate change are certainly an important consideration when trying to figure out how best to maximize the benefits. So what I'm going to drop this uh, to is to break it up into sections of talking about just in general sea level rise effects on marshes and then talk about the challenges of, of looking at these individualized fragments that are left for us in the Bay Area and the consequences for the endemic vertebrates as well as adaptive management options for dealing with them. A perspective on how our estuary sits against the rest of the country is kind of interesting. The Gulf Coast is really a relatively low tidal range, one to two feet. The Atlantic Coast, two and a half to seven and a half. Pacific Coast is five to 11, uh, depending on which part of the coast you're on. So to a great extent, we have a wider tidal range. That's kind of a good thing because you can bring in more sediment with a wider tidal range. And in fact, a recent paper by Kerwin et al. Uh, with the uh, USGS Patuxent uh, Research Station Center uh, found a model that would fit pretty well to understanding this and that the tidal range is one of the most important things to understand as well as the suspended sediment concentration. And so he used a bunch of estuaries across the world to look at this relationship and this graphic shows this sea level rise threshold when you start drowning marshes as you add water because they don't keep up by accreting. Compared to the sediment concentration, these lines that are pink line shows one meter, three meter, and five meters of the tidal range. We're about somewhere around uh, nine, eight to nine feet in the South Bay and a little bit less in the North. So we're kind of listed right in this area. So really the threshold is that somewhere around 20 to 30 millimeters per year uh, rise will start to, in general, from these generalized models, result in drowning and in other words that the marshes can't keep up with the uh, rise of sea level rise. Now, in San Francisco Bay itself, there's variation. It's quite interesting. The South Bay definitely has a lot more tidal range than the North Bay. And with this, it means a difference in how you, I guess, rate these marshes relative to their survivability, as well as what habitats they might uh, support. So the sed suspended sediment concentration range varies, and uh, the number is rough, but 30 to 70 milligrams per liter is kind of right in the middle of that graphic. So what about the challenges and the habitat parcels we're talking about? Most of the studies of sea level rise are top down. They're telling you, here's the world picture, here's the regional picture. We're trying to say that a lot in terms of management should be bottom up, looking at individual parcels and try to understand better 
how we figure out whether we should take this one parcel and manage it a certain way. So what we tried to do is look at sediment modeling, vegetation surveys, elevation data, and water level, uh, and try to understand a lot better how a particular parcel works within a particular management um, uh, structure. So what we've been using is RTK GPS, so GPS units that are very accurate to a few centimeters, and just hiking out there. Now, LIDAR is a great tool if you get it in the right area and you really want to see vegetation tops. But if you want to see the ground, you kind of have to get out there and do it. So it's kind of like the just go out there and do it type method, but we think it's very effective on a parcel-based approach. So we're able to do this to map, for example, San Pablo Bay Refuge, looking at the elevation gradient across that, as well as go out and map the vegetation heights and tell you exactly where the height is for the habitat structure that the animals use. I'm going to show three quick slides of our scattered 12 sites that we picked for this project, mostly picked because they did a gradient across the Bay Area, but also that they had information on animals where we had done some work or there was survey data. So looking at mean tide level, most of these areas are above, uh, above the uh, water. And so you'll see a little bit of blue indicated in the bottom here that shows that there's some inundation going on even at mean sea level in some places that are quite low, most to the south. And then as you look at mean high water, here's mean high water, look which ones are getting covered right away. It's those to the south. And then finally, underneath mean higher high water, most everything is inundated. There's uh, not inundation at Coon Island, but uh, again, the sites to the north tend to be the ones that are covered over the latest. So it gives you an example of the distribution or differences across the Bay Area. Here's another closer example looking from the side of the bare earth model of Petaluma Tidal Marsh at the water level that we normally see it at. Now when you add water to the top of it at two meters and then add the vegetation or the pickweed forest on top, inundation rate shows how much it takes before you end up with total inundation. These are levels we see now. It does mean that the animals are adapted to handle these levels, but the question is can they handle it when it increases or the frequency becomes more often. We've finally collected a year of water level data in these marshes and are trying to look at the surface elevation, the sarcocornea level, grindelia level, the plants that are tall, of whether or not they provide escape cover for some of these animals. This example will show you at water level, at mean tide level, going up to water level with a half meter of sea level rise. And you can see the issue that here you have the surface is covered in some places some of the times, but you have plenty of escape cover in the vegetation as soon as you get to a half meter sea level rise, and by the way, the predictions are still 1.9 meters is what's being used, which you heard in earlier talks by Bruce. That means that in general, at a half meter, which we're gonna see somewhere in the 2050 to 2075 range, that probably you're going to have to have this adjustment of animals moving or the habitat moving up to keep track or, or follow the sea level rise that's predicted. So, what we were trying to do is integrate this with some modeling efforts and try to put together the information on a parcel level. Will a given wetland drowned? Uh, what's the final inundation pattern and what species are affected? So can we look at this and determine which parcels are gonna be affected uh, how? Uh, the model that approach we're doing is working with one that was developed by John Callaway initially to look at uh, biomass uh, and organic matter production in a marsh. And Kathleen Swanson is doing this as part of her postdoc, which what she's trying to do is adapt and use the sea level rise prediction curves, of which there's uh, several that you can pick from, and do the range of that. But look at productivity in the marsh and try to estimate a function for that as well as look at the sediment input. And one of the newer parts of this model will be more direct sediment input information that will be added in to hopefully help better predict in a particular marsh what will be the likelihood of the marsh keeping up with the sea level rise. In the end, what we hope is this is an example of uh, China Camp and the, the actual groundwork on the bottom left and then on the top right, the differences across the marsh to tell us which parts of the marsh will stay above water at which level. So we'll be able to use this for parcel by parcel doing some prediction work and hopefully better understand how the mammals might, or, or birds might use these areas. So what about the consequences for these vertebrates? I've kind of broken down to just three brief uh, messages. Distribution uh, effects are expected where endemic vertebrates may emigrate from areas because the water levels come up or they could be lost. And survival, uh, individual survival is potentially going to decrease and a reproduction productivity may decline. 
Here's an example of the uh, black rail uh, home ranges that we've done through radio telemetry. And you can see that the actual home range area is quite small. So these areas that the rail is found within is you know, just a half hectare, uh, down to a tenth of a hectare for main core use areas. So in terms of trying to understand better which species need which areas, the more we understand this, the more likely we would to say how much of an area within a marsh is the critical area that protects the species. Recently, we've been trying to look at this problem a little closer relative to if there are high areas, will the animals come to use it? In this case, we've been using a project in cooperation with Arrowhead Marsh and East Bay Regional Parks to put out artificial uh, islands and see whether we put out these artificial islands, whether the rails will come. And in fact, the short answer is that putting out 10 islands this winter, they did come. And surprisingly, how much they came, they actually were, instead of like maybe one at a high tide in the whole year, they're coming all the time to use these islands. And in fact, what we're seeing is this curve of really high use. Up with sea level rise now, but we can use the model to predict when they might start lagging behind sea level rise. And um, I think when that starts to happen, there will be a rapid shift in the relative elevation of these wetlands. Um, they probably won't go subtitle. Um, they, they might, you know, uh, transition from Salicornia marshes to Spartina marshes. Um, and, you know, we're going to try and evaluate those changes and when they might be happening. But for the managers and decision makers, knowing, you know, that, that time scale might be decades, um, you know, is an important piece of information to have when making long-term management decisions. Um, and I'm going to uh, point out one other thing. The Kerwan model that you showed at the very beginning that showed uh, the critical rate of sea level rise versus sediment concentration, that is based on modeling for Spartina alternate flora, which has a much higher productivity than Salicornia, which is the dominant marsh type in our high marshes. So that might be a rosier scenario than is happening here, and we don't have a lot of information about the productivity rate for Salicornia. So we're, we're working on integrating that, but it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Any other questions? I have a question for Mark, switching gears to Mercury. So we heard um, this morning from Greg Schoenberger about all the sediment that's coming in into South Bay. We also know that there's a lot of mercury associated with sediment just in the larger San Francisco estuary. So I guess my question, and we also, you, you showed the slide with um, uh, the silver side data from Daryl Slotten in showing very high levels of um, mercury in silver side in South Bay. So being that South Bay is a sediment rich environment, how do we know how much of that s mercury associated with the sediment is really um, localized sources in South Bay um, in the Elbiso watershed versus just what's coming, all the sediment that we heard about is coming through the Dumbarton Narrows that gives us mud flats, but also might be giving us some mercury. It's, it's definitely a good question. It actually goes to my point about really the value of understanding sediment dynamics in general. But one thing we do know, but I didn't show, and was part of the earlier study we did with the SFEI, is the concentrations in Alviso Slough are about three times higher than just outside of Alviso Slough and, and just South San Francisco Bay in general, even just up to Dumbarton Bridge. There's a clear concentration gradient of mercury from upstream in Alviso Slough, downstream, and, and, and there's a very known point source. Yeah. So, so we know that part. Um, the part that's, that's a little bit daunting is we also know that, some, that sediment's going to move. We, we, we don't, you know, there was modeling done, mm -hmm. um, but, but that was just numeric, and now we need to see how accurate that was, and more importantly, where is that stuff going? So as sediment starts to move around, which it's going to, um, I, we could imagine a lot of scenarios. And depending on where it goes, and a point that I didn't touch on, uh, depending on where the, the sediment that has mercury associated with it goes will have a very big impact on how much methylmercury is made, because it's got a lot more to do with habitat type that these particles land in than it mm -hmm. does with the absolute concentration of total mercury in terms of how much methylmercury is made. And so that's why you're expecting 
upon day eight to get better with tidal flow? There's, there's a few reasons, right. Mm -hmm. But a question of really uh, outstanding question is what happens on the marsh plains, in these areas that are, um, particularly with the birds, I think, uh, but on some of these marsh plain areas. Um, uh, Letitia Grenier did some really great work as part of our earlier study using mm -hmm. song sparrows, uh, looking, using those as a bioindicator on the marsh plains. And it, we, we had uh, some really uh, sort of surprising results with mm -hmm. uh, measurements we use for um, how much methylmercury might be being made correlated very well with mercury in, in the song sparrow blood. There, you know, these canary and coal mine biosentinel studies are extremely important, but there's, a, there's still a lot of questions about sediment movement and relative amounts of sediment movement. Uh, which sediment's being moved is very important to know. Okay. Any other questions? Ariana? I'm going to speak loudly. I, I no, no, you can't. <laughs> Wait for the microphone. We've got some folks on the. Okay. This is a question for Peggy. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the distribution of Spartina alterniflora in the north versus the south bay. And in particular, we're looking at some of the uh, restored sites in the north bay, the 15 or so hundred acres um, that have been breached and are moving toward, um, you know, early low marsh. And I was wondering if what you guys have found in terms of alterniflora. When you say the 1,500 acres, are you talking Sonoma Bay lands? I'm, I'm and sorry. I'm specifically talking about the salt ponds that have been restored. So oh, up along Napa. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, the, the Spartina alterniflora was initially introduced into on the east shore of the South Bay, in the East Bay, and it ha hybridized there, was subsequently transplanted to Elsie uh, Romer Marsh and a couple of other locations, but all primarily in the South Bay um, or Southish Bay. It has taken an, uh, an amount of time for it to migrate north, and that's where the most recent sightings we have. We just found a clone this last year in China Camp, of all places. That's the place, that's like my sanctuary. No, don't go there, but we found a clone in China Camp. It moved slowly up into the North Bay. Um, Petaluma River, it got up there, I believe, because of a discharge of some probably dredge material or cleaning of a dredge that ha of some kind of equipment that had been uh, contaminated with Spartina seed. It may have gotten up there that way. Um, but it hasn't gotten that far east up to where your projects are. We did find some in Sonoma Baylands, which we've treated. Uh, we found some along the shoreline of San Pablo Bay, which we've treated. We believe it's under control. There was a Caltrans project that we believe it may have been accidentally introduced to. We've treated that. Um, we, we pretty much have a handle on everything up there. Everyone has to keep their eyes open and let us know. Any other questions? I'll start out by saying um, this is, whole day has been great and it's just been excellent in the, this afternoon even though it's been doom and gloom it's still been wonderful. Somehow, I don't know exactly how. Uh, I'll direct this to, to John Takakawa, but it's really a way to drag Bruce Jaffe back into it. Um, the, uh, the question has to do with sediment and redistribution of sediment related to restoration projects, particularly Bear Island and other places where scour is, is expected to occur. Is there going to be enough, is that going to be a significant amount of sediment redistribution to have any impact on overall sediment budget for the Bay? That is a Bruce question. <laughs> so, simplistically, the answer is it, it won't have a large effect. It'll have a, a bit of an effect, but it won't have a large effect just because the, if you just take the area of the channels and come up with an estimate of how much scour there might be and then spread it out over the rest of the bay, it's it's probably, you know, the channel area is maybe one-tenth of what the the mudflat area is. So um, it could have an effect, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be a huge effect. One note to that is we're trying to uh, look at modeling the shoals. Is Again, the shoals to the tidal marshes are part of a continuum in a lot of people's view of if sea level rise comes up, it'll be the sed sediment coming off the edges of the marshes that will repopulate the shoals kind of with the sediment. And so that type of modeling would be really helpful in understanding this type of 
effects in certain areas of scour or accretion. Um, I have a question for John. Um, given the sea level rise situation, and you know you showed these pictures with marshes being just completely inundated, um, should we continue restoring the marshes like we are um, with the salt pond restoration project? That's a good question to end on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's I, in everybody's mind. <laughs> I think it's part of the decision process I've discussed, where between management and the research side, you can kind of look at what you need to know to know. Okay. So, so to ask Don Ramsalt, he knew. <laughs> and uh, that, that's all. But no, I, I really think we don't, we, it's hard to answer that in just a simple, yeah, sure, it's fine, just restore it, it'll be a great thing, worth all the money. I think it's a, it may be almost biopolitical question, decision type of uh, question that, that would be great to use as one of the springboards to try to have a little bit more refined questions for climate change research. Mm -hmm. uh, well, too, I think, you know, Kathleen uh, Slenton pointed out, you know, there's still modeling that needs to go on to look at uh, marsh accumulation processes, not just sea level rise. There might be um, natural processes that mitigate uh, the, the, just the, the sea level rise. I mean, we saw that in um, the marsh that, uh, was it Triangle Marsh, uh, that, that the Watson paper looked at. There was subsidence in the Elviso area of about 100 centimeters, if I'm remembering correctly, or more. And that paper showed that the marsh could keep, up, keep pace with that sort of relative sea level rise um, in terms of a drop in, in um, land, land surface area. So I think the jury seems to me to be out. Anyway, that's what I'm getting. We, we don't fully understand all the processes that could ameliorate sea level rise or at least keep pace with it. I think mm -hmm. that's where it gets into the, the conversations that BCDC and others have been having too about land planning and planning to allow for expansion of intertidal area, not just a footprint of it with, with a ring around it. And uh, that, that goes in with the whole mix of everything else to be talking about. Okay, well we're, oh there's, should we take one more question? Let's take one more. Oh. Um, my question was uh, mostly to John, but feel free to pass it off. Um, <laughs> Aaron's good at handing here. Um, my question is how, uh, you focused very much on how the uh, animals were responding, would respond to sea level rise, but some of the other comments we've heard here suggest that the um, plants may change sooner at, in response to sea level rise. If they aren't keeping up, you're going to have fresher marsh, speaking as a hydrogeologist. Um, so you'll convert from Sparti uh, to Spartina from um, Salicornia. Will that affect the animals? before they start being washed away by the high tide? Uh, that's, I think, part of what we're trying to do in a research program of actually measuring the component of the structure. Because I think to a great extent, animals are looking at structure. This is their home. And we don't have a good view of that. And we're trying to get better ideas of what are the critical pieces of that. And so that that will drive the animals one way or another uh, early on as far as what, what places have the enough height for them to have protection for predation and enough places for their nests. So yeah, we are understanding the plants along the way. We kind of like want to make sure, well, our focus has been the endpoint of the vertebrates to a great extent is kind of the indicators because it kind of wraps up a few things. But I think Kathleen's models and others will try to look at this with the vegetation as well. Okay, so if you're anything like me, I'm sitting here thinking there's a lot of unknowns here. Kind of frustrating, uh, you know, in very many aspects. Um, we still don't fully understand the system that we're working in. Uh, still lots of unanswered questions. And, you know, I want to emphasize this is just the beginning of an experiment. This is really one or two years of um, phase one over a projected 50 year, you know, restoration effort. So, um, you know, 
it's not surprising that we don't have all the answers and we have more questions than we have answers. We, I started out this morning identifying some key uncertainties in our, in our work and these key uncertainties were identified um, because they were the difficult questions to answer. So we're not going to have answers in one or two years. Also, I want to emphasize that much of the data that we've collected so far really was sort of our before picture, before a lot of the, breach, uh, the main breaches are going on at SF2, at um, Pond A A6 and Pond A8 complex, yet alone Eden Landing. So this is just sort of the first half, and even, even with that, we've gotten a lot of interesting information we're understanding how complex the ecosystem is um, and that's all good. I mean, I think we're still getting um, good information. It shows that we need to continue to study these areas, especially post-breach intensively, especially in this, these first early phases of restoration so we can inform subsequent phases with good scientific data. So that's all I have to do. Oh, I want one more thing. Sorry. I forgot to mention this morning. Sorry. Um, we have tide gauges in now in South San Francisco Bay. Um, recently put in, in December and January, a, um, a long-term gauge at the confluence of Coyote and Alviso and a temporary gauge at Dunbarton Narrows, thanks to the Fish and Wildlife Service um, for purchasing those and installing them, and thanks to Ann Stern from the Corps of Engineers for all her technical guidance and having them put in. Um, the, the plan is for us to collect uh, three months worth of data. We'll, uh, the data will be reviewed by, the vertical datums will be reviewed by NOAA and posted on their website and that at the end of a full year of data, we'll calculate tidal datums from that one year of data. So um, we'll be sending out information and posting it on our website, but I did want to let you all know of that. Um, I know many researchers are interested in getting a, a better handle on uh, tidal datums and vertical datums in the South Bay. That's been a big um, data gap. So uh, thanks to Fish and Wildlife Service and um, Corps of Engineer for providing that. Thanks to everyone for sticking with us for a long day. I know uh, there was a lot of information thrown at us today. Um, I think it's abundantly clear that this is a very complex system. And I want to assure you that uh, the planning process is, is, is equally complex. Uh, it's a dynamic e ecosystem, and our adaptive management uh, process is quite dynamic as well. I, I, I've learned a lot today. I think we all have and uh, are starting to look to the future um, with new questions in mind. And so with that, I'd like to emphasize that this project is now starting to look toward the next phase of restoration. Uh, we've talked about this at our stakeholder forum and at, Al at our Alviso working group. We have a, a Ravenswood uh, working group next Thursday. You can get the information on our website. And then next month, we're going to have an Eden Landing working group starting to talk about phase two. And so phase two doesn't necessarily just mean phase two restoration actions on the ground. It also means phase two applied studies. So the questions that have been raised here today are going to further focus the science program for the project. So I would like to thank all of our researchers and all of you for hanging in here and uh, we hope to see you at these meetings and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> the poster session will, the posters will be up so we invite people to stay. Um, and view the posters and mingle and uh, continue to ask questions of these researchers while we have everybody in the same room at the same time. Thank you.